Broadcasting from the Keep Moving Forward Creator Studios, it's time for the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. This limited release show features the stories of the 2019 contestants of Dwayne The Rock Johnson's athletic competition, NBC's The Titan Games. Now here's your host, Katie Galley. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Athletes of the Titan Games podcast. I'm your host, Katie Galley. In the Keep Moving Forward Creator Studio with me today, I have Titan Games athlete and firefighter, Steve Hoppy. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing good. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, share your story with us today. Yeah, you bet. So just to uh, kick things off, I want to ask, um, where did you grow up and how, if at all, was your childhood shaped by athletics? Um, I was born in Tucson, Arizona, and... Uh... I'd say sports have always been a big part of my life. Um, I was uh, I was one of the – how I came into this world was kind of just a little bit unique and interesting. Um, when I was born, uh, the doctors pretty much thought I wasn't going to live past day three. Um, I had some complications, and that stuff was uh, my respiratory um, system. And it, with it being compromised and whatnot, I actually told my mom because my mom didn't want to have any – more kids after me um she was she was gonna have her tubes tied and they're like uh you might want to wait on that um wow we're not quite sure if he's gonna make it past uh day three and um you know i'm here today uh, i don't know my uh, i went straight to the icu my mom didn't even get to see me um i had tubes running all in and out of me all over the place on different type of ventilators and whatnot and Kind of some of the things that, uh, the complications and that stuff that I had from the, the birth, uh, I lost my high pitch hearing. Um, so I had some learning disabilities, um, speech impediments, and I actually thought at one point that I was going to lose my hearing completely. So they were trying to teach me sign language. Wow. So, you know, in Tucson, I was good because, you know, most of the kids that I was grew up around knew me just for me being me. But with my dad moving to Minnesota when I was about eight, you know, through he worked for IBM, so we got transferred to Minnesota. So, you know, moving to a new state, moving to a new location, um, you know, I was a different kid on the block. So a lot of kids tried to uh, to bully me, tried to make fun of me, and you know, that didn't really work out too well for him because my dad's started me in uh, jiu-jitsu and and wrestling and that stuff at an early age so i was always able to handle myself but that was also an outlet for me too you know to be able to handle those situations and and the emotional part of it and just be able to you know then have a place to go to so where i could just uh, get my anger out and get some of the, the things that i had going on that were in my head during those you know at that age too so it was it was fun <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean it's you know channeling that en- energy channeling all of those emotions like you're saying into into that sport funneling them into jujitsu and wrestling and all of those physical activities and i imagine helped as creating that outlet for yourself oh it definitely did it was uh you know it was an emotional outlet for me it uh helped me develop mentally physically and uh you know being in a, a sport where it's just individual one-on-one you know, I, I think it really helped me with my mental strengths yeah. and being, being able to overcome a lot of obstacles and things that have come up in my life. Um, you know, one of the greatest things that could have happened for our family at that time was uh, my dad moving to uh, Rochester, Minnesota. My uh, We had an option to go to San Jose or to Rochester, and my dad chose Rochester, and my mom shortly after that was diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, it was stage four and they told her that she only had six months to live at the time. And, you know, one of the great things about Rochester at the time was the Mayo Clinic was there and it was one of the leading research facilities in the world. And during that time frame, the FDA approved for the trial of uh, bone marrow transplants. And if it wasn't for faith or whatever you want to say just everything happens for a reason um we spent our time there for my mom to get you know better and she she overcame it and and uh 
kicked kicked cancer's ass twice. Um, you know, she's she's gone through a lot herself, and you know those things helped me. You know, tremendously. You know, at the time you don't look at it and think about it, but when you look back at it, it's kind of one of those things where you you've learned to overcome adversity, learn to look at the positive things, and and really uh, enjoy what you got going on. So. Yeah. Wow. I I mean that's that's amazing too. The, I mean how resilient your mother was and then being able to see that. But I mean and like you're saying at, now you can look back and reflect and um you know everything happens for a reason and seeing these things and seeing um you know those experiences have helped shape you into who you are today. But at that time going through that having moved to a new state, um being in a new environment, starting these new sports, just everything that was uh, and everything that was going on um in with your family, with your mom, how did you at such a young age then um in that moment begin to just to deal with all of that? Um you know, I think a lot of it was how I dealt with it was sports um was wrestling. You know, when I moved to Rochester, you know, they didn't really have jujitsu up there, and I, I really focused in on wrestling. My dad was a big advocate towards it. Um, I really channeled a lot of my effort into wrestling, became one of the top wrestlers in the nation. Um, you know, I, I basically did wrestling 365 days a year. Wow. Um, it was my passion. It was something that I loved. Um, and it gave me that outlet. It allowed me to remove myself. I think when I look back at it, it allowed me to remove myself from all the craziness that was going on and just have a little bit of me. And, and for me, I think that was my big outlet. It allowed me to grow and it allowed me to deal with all the things that were going on. Yeah, and I mean that makes a lot of sense, sense, especially with a sport like wrestling, which it's it's just you and the other opponent on the mat, and really having to have that mental discipline to stay in that match when it's going on, and knowing it's just you up against you up against him, you up against your opponent at that time, and um, trying to have I guess create that experience and know um, know what it takes to overcome that, and then having that transcend into other areas of your life, but knowing too that it was. It was your release as well from all of the craziness that was going on around you. Definitely. So, I mean, that's amazing, too, then growing as um, becoming one of the top wrestlers in the nation and growing really as an athlete in that sport and developing an aptitude and seeing that you were so skilled at it. So then going um, through middle school and high school and beyond, did then you start to have aspirations to play at a collegiate level or a higher level? Um, or was your did your wrestling career um, end uh, in high school? Um, my wrestling career did end in high school, um, you know, we were in Minnesota for probably roughly about four or five years. And then I ended up, you know, my choices that my dad had was to go to Rochester or San Jose. Well, mm -hmm. vision and Rochester, and he ended up going to San Jose anyway. So we, we took that trek across the country and, wow. um, middle school and high school, uh, we moved to Minnesota or moved to California and there in the Bay area. And, and, you know, I continued wrestling probably all the way through high school, but I kind of fizzed out and lost that that drive and that passion that I had for wrestling. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, I refocused my energy and that stuff and, and became really involved with football. Um, I think it was probably my sophomore, junior year, I realized that I had the skill set and the, and the ability to play at a collegiate level. Um you know, I had a scholarship offer for wrestling. I had scholarship offers for football. But ultimately, in the end, I ended up walking on at Arizona State. And uh, and walked on at Arizona State and kind of took my football dreams down that route. Um, unfortunately, about the time that I was starting to flourish in 2001, um, I ended up having... Um, career-ending surgery on both my legs at bilateral fasciotomies, which are basically compartment syndrome. Um, so they had to go in and relief, relieve my the pressure and that stuff in my calves. But during that time, the doctor, um, you know, nicked one of my veins, and I had some internal bleeding inside, which kind of um, killed off some of the muscles in my calves. Oh, my gosh. So 
the the surgery itself and and the recovery I could have came back and played but with the the mistake of hitting Nick in one of the veins and that stuff and all the internal bleeding it uh, hindered me as far as I lost that step you know that that quickness and and that first step I kind of lost which was important in the position that I played you know as a fullback and uh, you know it was kind of the end. Uh, as far as my football career went. <laughs> oh, man. So well, when that did happen, when you had that those that career-ending surgery that happened to you, um, and, I mean, imagine feeling as if your football career was uh, had prematurely come to a close. It ended at a time when you weren't necessarily ready for it to end. How did you manage through that transition? How did you deal with that um, mentally n- not being able to continue at that high level of play? Um, it was, it was something that took a while for me. You know, I went through a depressive state there for a little while. Um, I think at that time, you know, for me, it was, I'd really kind of redirected my focus. I wasn't necessarily happy, but I was, you know, I knew I had to finish what I started and that was to get my degree. Mm. Um, you know, I was accepted in during 2001, you know, it was kind of a highlight for me. You know, I got accepted into the WP Carey School of Business. Um, I was competing, and you know, at that time, you know, in my football career, it was something where I could see I could be playing at the next level. Um, but I really, I switched from linebacker to fullback at that time and moved up to depth chart pretty quick, and was starting on all special teams. And you know, I think uh, it given me a couple more years of experience at that position, I would have been able to play at the next level. And, you know, that was my goal. That was my whole focus, you know, at that point. And when the surgeries happen, you know, just like with anything in sports, you're going to have surgeries at some point. It's not when, it's, or it's not if you are, it's when you're going to have it. Yeah. Um, and you just, I was ready to just get after it, get the rehab done. And, and when I found out that there was some complications from the surgery and I was no longer allowed are going to be able to play at that high level. It was, it was a gut shot. It was, uh, you know, I thought that was going to be my future. I had plans, you know, to get in the, I got, ended up getting my degree in real estate, but my plans was to, you know, get into the NFL network, meet people. You know, I don't come from a wealthy family, but my goal was to build strip malls and to build big commercial buildings and stuff like that. You know, you got to have money to be able to do that. And uh, my goal was to go to the NFL, meet people, network, find business investors, and really take that route after I completed my football career. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I didn't get that opportunity. And uh, so I just had to move forward. Um, it probably took me about five or six years to fully – get back to where I could run three, four days a week continuously without my calves being on fire, just hurting or just being a disability as far as being able to walk and stuff like that. Um, I focused on my career as far as uh, getting my degree. And I probably, I was lost for a long time. Um, I ended up graduate walking in 2004 at ASU. Didn't get my actual diploma until 2006. Um, I just kind of wandered for a while. Um, I was a server for a long time, worked at some high-end restaurants, um, worked at Chase Bank. As a personal banker, uh, moved my way up to uh, management. Um, I, uh, then I started a construction company. Um, but all those years, that I was just missing something in my life. Um, and that was football. And then 2009, I shut my my tile business completely down, just walked away from it. Um, at that time, uh, I just got married in 2007 to my wife, who I met at ASU, who was the one who actually diagnosed me with my compartment syndrome because they thought I had shin splints. Wow. Um, but in 2009, we sat down talks. And I was like, I had a successful business going, but it just wasn't making me happy. And I said, I need to get back to football. I need to get back to the things that made me happy. And I uh, got a job at Scottsdale Community College as a special teams coach and a running back coach. Um, I was probably there a week until I met my my mentor in the game, 
uh, Coach Gary Zahner, who's a former uh, special teams coordinator under Denny Green and worked for the Cardinals, worked for the Minnesota Vikings throughout the 90s, and, and in 2000 he was with the Baltimore Ravens. Um, he was working, he specializes with uh, specialists, so punters, kickers, and long snappers, and uh, he was there on the field working with uh, one of our punters, and I was just so impressed with him that I asked him for a job. I said, can I have a job? I'll work for you for free. I don't care, just as long as I can learn and be taught by you and uh, see how things go. You know, I was so naive on how the coaching business works. And, uh, you know, he must have been just impressed or just went out on a limb. But I met him on Thursday and Tuesday, or that next day, he actually called me back. He said, you know who Denny Green is? I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> I played football. <laughs> and uh, he's all, well, they started a new league called the United Football League. And um, we have an intern position for you. Are you, is that something you're interested in? And, and my wife was out of town back at home in Nebraska, and uh, I called her up. And I'm like, we talked about it. Both agreed that was the way to go. And uh, by Tuesday, I was down in Casa Grande um, with the football team starting training camp. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, and my wife, you know, after that first three months, you know, conversations and just she's like, the passion was back in me again. She's like, I haven't seen you like that since I met you in 2001, how happy I was, how, how much this just made me who I was again. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from there it was just kind of a, a whirlwind, you know, three months later, Denny Green offered me a contract. Um, he just saw how passionate I was and how quickly I picked things up. And he was just impressed with, with my work ability and just, everything about the game that I was doing and just he, he offered me a contract and uh, did that for another three years. And then the UFL folded financially and uh, I struggled again, <laughs> yeah. you know, just life for you, just yeah. hurdles. Yeah. And uh, 2012, you know, I was back trying to find a job again and uh, spent two years, just flying around the country, sending resumes, just sitting in coaches' offices, you know, waiting to get five minutes with them to to try to get a job. You know, to me, um, and what we did in the UFL, you know, even though it was a short period of time with coaching, we did some – we had the top special teams in all four areas, um, all three years that we coached in special teams. Um you know, at that point, I'm probably – I've been mentored by probably the, the top specialist coach in the world. Um, you know, I still work for him now and work camps and do one-on-one -on -one lessons, and and we run combines for the NFL for specialists. And probably a good percentage of the guys in the NFL have come through us as far as either our training or one-on-one -on -one camps and stuff. Wow. So, to me, I feel like I have the ability to coach and – the next level, whether it's, you know, division one football or, or the NFL, but I've just never been able to get that opportunity. And I had a son that was born, and, you know, at that point I had to get a job. And so I ended up uh, meeting a chief for the fire department who helped me, mentored me in, in that end. And now I work for Mesa fire. Wow. Man, so, that's, that's an incredible, I mean, just journey through athletics and, and beyond. And it's, you know, a testament utilizing those skills. You wanted to be an athlete more than anything, but then learning, you know, that um, you really could excel as a coach too by guiding the next generation of individuals to help achieve their goals. Even though you felt your career had ended prematurely, you could coach and guide in that way. And so then um, when the UFL folded, still, you know, knowing that you had that passion on your heart, but then, um, you know, finding kind of a new direction to go and having the opportunity open up to become um, to ultimately become a firefighter and so um, when when this career path opened up for you what made you decide then that you wanted to to go down it to become a firefighter um, you know the guy that I met my chief that I met uh, Monty Eggerman um, you know we have we're kind of similar mindsets he's 
60 year old dude that's just in the best shape of his life like you look at him you're just like holy cow <laughs> and you know just the whole perception behind the fire department what it has to offer and you know you know at that time i started a family so you know what better career to have a family with is the fire department you know it's something that your kids it's a respectable career where you know your kid will look up to you and and see all the good that you're doing for the community and whatnot so you know my big thing is i would just want to help people i want to you know be part of that you know i thought through football you know the biggest thing for me is football is these players get so caught up in just playing the game and they don't realize that there's another step beyond football that they have to prepare for Mm -hmm. and you know my biggest thing is I wanted to become a head coach at a division one football program because I want to prepare those kids for life and I think with the way that that football has become they're not allowing these kids they're not giving the tools to these kids to be ready to go into life to be ready to go to life after football and um you know that was my whole goal and obviously i haven't been able to go down that path and it doesn't mean that it's still not there in the future i'm still fairly young especially in the coaching world yeah um but the fire department was just something that landed in my lap it was a it's a great career it's very rewarding um I'm passionate about it, not as much as I am with coaching or sports, but (laughs) it's still something that brings a lot of the locker room mentality back in, which is is what I love. So, you know, for me going down the the fire department track, it was just something that just kind of fell in my lap and and it worked for me. So. And it's, it is great. You get to satisfy that, that desire to still be physically fit and go after that. But I mean, to your point, yeah, it's, um, it is easy to overlook, especially as a young athlete. At some point, your athletic career does come to a close and it's hard to actually envision that when you're in the sport, when you're playing it. But when it does actually end and the realization sets in, it's so difficult to bridge that gap and make that jump. Because if you if you've played that sport your whole life or the latter half of your life and you loved it and you wanted it to just drive everything that you did, you allow your identity to get wrapped up in it. And so when it does come to a close, it's what do you do next? How do you manage that and so to your point having mentors having coaches having people in your life who have already gone through that transitional period then you can help guide those athletes who are about to go through it or who currently are going through it into that next phase of their life helping prepare them to know okay there's more to life than just football yeah yeah Yeah, and that's my that's my thing is I didn't have a lot of that through college you know right they push you push you push you you know you know, you're on a, you, they basically control your schedule. Your life is basically in their hands. And, um, you know, I know when I went through it and then when I got hurt, it was completely, I was gone. You know, I was out of the program. Nobody checked on me. Nobody, you know, Hey, made sure that I was on the right track. You know, I basically left the program and, and nobody cared. Hmm. And, uh, you know, for me, that was kind of hard because I put so much, I tried to give so much to the program. And as soon as I was injured and they no longer needed me, it was kind of a, awesome. See, see you later. So, yeah. you know, and it, it's, it's been a struggle. It's been hard for me because, you know, I really put everything into the program at Arizona state. And every coaching change that they've had that's gone in there. I've, uh, I've tried to just get the lowest quality job that I could just to prove myself, just like I did with Denny Green and and the UFL. And uh, I've never gotten an opportunity to to be able to prove to anybody. You know, unfortunately, with football, and you learn it as you go. It's a good old boy club. It's not about what you know; it's who you know. And uh, being sometimes being at the right place at the right time. Hmm. So yeah, but. Well, I mean, going off of that, though, with the opportunities that you have had and that you've really gone full force on um, to, you know, to be to support your family and going after these careers and knowing that on your heart someday that is your true goal to be um, a division one football coach. But then also seizing those opportunities, being at the right place at the right time. How did you um, 
ultimately stumble upon this opportunity to be a contestant on the Titan Games? And how did that um, how did that align with, um, you know, these goals that you have set for yourself and wanting to, you know, all, when it came up, how did you decide to go after it? Well, I think a lot of the driving force was in uh, 2016. I was uh, diagnosed with cancer. Oh. I was actually uh, on my motorcycle at work. I was on light duty and uh, going from a training facility to a hospital for, for just med exams. And I was on my motorcycle and a kid pulled out in front of me. Um, I ended up uh, put, laying my bike down hit him, went over the top of the car, landed in the middle of the intersection. And uh, during the visit to the ER, um, at, after that, I uh, they brought me into the, the ER. I ended up, uh, they ended up doing an EKG, did the x-rays, you know, did blood work. Doc came in, you're good to go. I'm like, ah, I'm not quite sure about that. I want a CT done on my thoracic area. And uh, he's like, well, you don't need that. You know, everything that we're seeing is you're fine. I'm like, well, listen, I'm like, you know, with my mechanism of injury, what I just went through, I'm not leaving here without a CT. And he's like, he finally concided and said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll get the seat. I'll order the CT for you. Hour later, he comes back in and he's, you know, he's all, sometimes there's things that aren't related to your accident that show up and, uh, you know, I'm at Banner Gateway in Mesa, Arizona, and right next to it is MD Anderson. And I'm at the Banner Gateway ER, and he's like, we need you to make an appointment as soon as you can next door. And I'm like, my wife just completely breaks down. She's in surgical sales. She's, she knows what's going on, all the hospitals. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm like, back up. I'm like, what did you find? I'm like, just back up. You can't just come at me and just say, hey, you need to make the next door, you know, an appointment next door at MD Anderson as soon as possible. And uh, he's like, well, we found a, a mass in your anterior medius sign of about two and a half inches. He's all, you have two enlarged lymph nodes in your neck and your spleen's enlarged. I'm like, all right. I'm like, just with, with anything, I'm, okay, tell me what, what do I got? And he's like, well, I can't, you know, diagnose you. I'm like, I'm not asking you to diagnose me. I'm just based on your education and what you've seen through your career. What do you think it is? And he eventually, you know, said, you know, that he thinks it's some type of lymphoma. And that was October 4th when I was hit. And then in, uh, two, in about two, three weeks later, going through all the testing, I had a, a lymphectomy, I had needle biopsy, I had, you know, bone biopsy going through everything that they do pet scans um they finally came out and said that i had stage two hodgkin's lymphoma and november 16th was my first round of chemo and you know at that point i was 36 years old i haven't competed since i played football and having a son that was uh was four years old at that time coming around the Super Bowl came out, which I I watch every year, and I saw The Rock come on and say that he was putting out the show, and he's looking for guys that have had struggles in life, and you know he's looking for the person that is you know has gone through a lot, and it kind of hit home with me. Um, I've followed The Rock for a long time, and followed him on social media, followed him on Instagram, and just I've always loved his story. He seems very genuine. Yeah. Very, uh, you know, down to earth and, you know, wanting to give back what he's done for the military, setting up uh, stuff in Hawaii for him, you know, doing big concerts, you know, seems like he's always there for the people. And and to me, that that just hit home. And I was like, well, this will be a great opportunity for me to to talk about my story, to set example for my kids. You know, I've got four kids uh, now. I have four kids. But at the time I had three. Um, when I went through cancer, I had twin girls that were th that were uh, 10 months at the time. Um, and for me, it was just kind of, I need to set example. I need to show something for my kids that, you know, no matter what you go through, if you have family, you have the right support around you, you can do anything and everything that you want to do. Um, you're going to go through ups and downs. You're going to have roadblocks. You're going to have these things in life, but that's life. 
and I just wanted to lead by example and give them something to look back at and go, my dad did that. I can do it. You know, whatever it is that they need, whatever adversity that they go through. So, you know, and then I just put an application out there. I just got with my videographer that works with us uh, on our consulting company for specialists and he was on board and we spent probably three, four days filming. And then it probably took another three, four weeks of just filling out the application um, for the Titan game. So, wow. Man. So, and then that was that was kind of how the ball got rolling. Yeah. That was the thought process behind it. Man, that's, I mean, that's incredible to be sitting there and um, seeing that commercial and knowing, okay, this is a new challenge. I'm going to push myself. And it's, but it was not for your own gain at all. It was to show for your children. It was for um, people who needed someone to look up to, who knew that, you know, no matter the struggle, no matter the obstacles that you face, you can push past it. You can overcome it. You just have to have that will and that desire to. And so you deciding um, no matter how hurt you are in this, this state that you were in, you just, you just making that decision. All right, I'm going to push myself and it's going to be for others. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was, yeah. you know, it, it had nothing to do for personal gains for me. I've got a beautiful family. I've got a great wife. You know, I've got a great career. Um, you know, for me, it's not, it's not about what I'm going to get out of this. It's about, you know, le- life lessons for my kids, somebody for them to look up to. Also, once I started getting in, into the story and telling my story, you know, people come up to, dude, you got to, you got to talk about this because this is an inspiration for a lot of people, you know, and sometimes they just need somebody or just see that somebody got went through this and is doing, you know, this kind of stuff that they can do it too. And, and for me, when I started thinking about it and I was like, you know what, this is a perfect opportunity. This is a perfect platform to get the message out and to, to help as many people as I can. Hmm. Man. I, I love that. And that, and that is so true. I mean, just having the opportunity, it's one having lived it and having this experience, but not just, you know, keeping it to yourself, realizing this is a platform. This is a way that you can touch other people. And so again, selflessly putting that out there and sharing your story, um, just in that raw context, letting them know, Hey, I really did struggle. And if you're struggling too, that's okay. Because you can, you can persevere, you can push past this. Man, yeah, that's... what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> love that. So, uh, um, Steve, from this incredible experience that you've had and just the life that you've led, but um, focusing in on this experience that you had at the Combine and then eventually as a contestant on the Games, what would you say is your definition of a Titan? And how do you believe that your experience on the Titan Games will now carry over into the rest of your life? Um, I just think, you know, as far as the Titan goes, you know, they've interviewed me and asked me this before, you know, for me is, you know, when you read the definition of a Titan as somebody who's a master, somebody who's of their own, of their own world or what they do, whether you're Mozart, he was a Titan of, you know, being a musician. You know, if you look at, say, like Peyton Manning, you know, he's a Titan of the quarterback position or Bill Belichick, the titan of the coaching world, you know. Everybody has can be, become a titan of whatever they, they put their mind to. And for me, you know, I told him, I'm like, I'm a titan in my own world. Um, what I've overcome, what I've done, um, my mindset and, and how I uh, perceive life and what I'm trying to accomplish, you know, for me, I'm, I'm already a titan in my own mind. Absolutely. Um, you know, for me, being on this show just allows me to show people the Titan that's within me. Mm-hmm. Um, going through the combine and meeting these people, the, these other people around me that were there, you know, th- everybody is a Titan in their own way. Um, and they've all gone through struggles and have inspired people. And, and that's why they're on the show. It's not only their physical capabilities, but their stories behind them. Yeah. And you know, this platform just allows these people to get out there and meet people and help people. And, 
you know, that was the whole thing with The Rock and what he was trying to, I believe, try to accomplish with the show. It's not about the physical attributes of it. Obviously, it's a big part of it because he, cause that's his genre. That's what he, he's all about is being in the weight room. You know, his his successes have all come from what all the hard work and everything that he's put into his body and to what he wants to, to succeed in. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if I got off on the, on the whole, the Titan thing is no, no. a different answer, but <laughs> no, that that's kind of, yeah. that's kind of where I'm coming from as far as the Titan and what a Titan is. Yeah. And this show just, this show just exemplifies what true Titans really are. You yes. know, whether we win or lose, we're all titans in our own minds, in our own world, as long as we continue to thrive and have a positive atmosphere, a positive mindset, we work hard, we stay consistent, and we just do the things that we love doing, and we don't let let adversity and that stuff keep us down. Yep. That's, that is great because putting it in, in that context, you know, thinking about narrowly the definition of a Titan in the realm of, of the of the show, the Titan games are in the realm of being physical, physically fit, but that's not where it is. It transcends all areas of life, no matter what what you do, what career, career path you find yourself down on, what goals you have for yourself. It's being a Titan in whatever it is you choose to decide to put your mind to. I, I love that because then, it, you know, it really does... It's not just in one area. It's in any area that you decide to put that work ethic and decide to put that effort into. The aspects of life. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> really. And that, yeah, you, that's only one that. way to live life and that's to its fullest. And <laughs> yes, and you, you got to put your passion and everything into it and not let life become man, mundane. And you got to always challenge yourself and try to find new things and and just expand your mind and and your your base so yeah man that and that's you know that's incredible advice to live by and it's truly a testament to the way that you live your life in a way that you are inspiring others to live their own and and in that vein um just with everything that you have accomplished and walking through these doors of opportunity and knowing that you still have so much left to accomplish with all these goals that you've set for yourself um steve i just have one more question that i ask all of my interviewees what do you want to be remembered for um wow (laughs) uh just somebody that's uh willing to put everything on the line um for his family um doesn't matter what it is i'm just i have kids now and I'm a dad and they're, they're my world and I'm going to try to do everything that I can to, to make them successful in life and be productive members in society and, and hopefully just good people. Thank you all for tuning in to today's installment of the athletes of the Titan games podcast to learn more about each of these Titan athletes. Be sure to check out their information in the links in my show notes. Furthermore, To stay up to date on all things coming out of the Keep Moving Forward Creator Studio, be sure to subscribe to the Keep Moving Forward Podcast iTunes channel and follow along on social media, also available in the show notes. As the creator of the Titan Games, Mr. Dwayne The Rock Johnson says, Titans aren't born, they're made. And I hope today's story helped you realize all that you are capable of becoming if you put in that hard work and just keep moving forward.